Hello, everyone. Um, I hope that you can hear me and see me and also see a big orange slide that says personal archiving and not my notes page. So if any of that does not apply, please put something in the chat box and I will try to fix it. Um, I am Heather Register Zabinden. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Roberts Library. We are part of the Central Arkansas Library System. Um, we're downtown across the street from the main library. And um, we are the, kind of the archives and special collections division of, of CALS. So let me get some windows moved over here so I can see everything I need to see all at once. Um, so this program, so you, if, if, if you should not be or do not want to be in personal archiving the basics of saving your family papers, then leave the meeting now. This is not for you. Um, but that's where you are today. And thank you for joining us. We've got quite a few people. And so that's exciting. Um, at the end of this, I will take questions. So, and I will try to answer um, all your questions um, as to the best of my ability. So we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like everybody's gotten here. We might have a few people coming in late, but um, we'll go ahead and get started. So like I said, I'm Heather Register Zabinden and I'm the outreach coordinator for the Roberts Library. CALS received a grant from the DC Public Library and the Institute of Museum and Library Services in 2009, kind of late 2009, and we are part of the National Memory Lab Network. The grant funds this training as well as the development of a DIY memory lab that is housed here at Roberts. And I will put this in the chat. Hopefully it's gonna let me do this. All my pieces and parts will work correctly. If you want more information um, about the memory lab or to make an appointment for the memory lab, I've just put the link, the direct link in the chat. Um, so like I said, I'll answer questions after the presentation. You'll be able to either come on camera and ask your question by using the raised hand feature, or you can type your questions in the chat box. Okay. Sorry, y'all. My keyboard decided to stop working. There we go. So just a quick disclaimer. This presentation, the content slides and other materials are under copyright and may not be reproduced without prior written permission of the Central Arkansas Library System. Now that legal is handled, let's dive into what we're gonna talk about today. So the do-it-yourself memory lab will open in two phases. It's located on the third floor of the Roberts Library, which is in downtown Little Rock. We're at the corner of Rock Street and President Clinton Avenue. Um, we're right across from the main library, right across from the river market. And the flatbed scanner station is already open. Um, you can come and we've had several people come and scan their photographs. It will scan up to about 11 by 14. Um, and you can scan multiple smaller photographs all at once. And then in August, specifically August 9th, we will open the AV side of the station. And that's where you can digitize things like VHS. Um, that will be opened on the 9th. You will be able to digitize VHS. We have some other formats that we will um, open up later on once VHS kind of, we kind of perfect that. Um, you will need to make reservations to use the memory lab. Um, reservations are two hours long and you can make back-to-back -back reservations. And once both sides of the lab are open, you'll, may, you'll be able to make a reservation for the flatbed scanner as well as the AV because the AV, when you're running, say you have a two hour VHS tape, um, it's gonna, 
that's going to digitize in real time. So you're going to need to be here the two hours while it's digitizing. And if you have um, flat photographs or regular photographs, um, non-digitized, that you want to digitize, then you can use the flatbed station at the same time. And the first 30 minutes of your first time on either station, you'll get a brief orientation on how to use it. Um, but this is a do-it-yourself process. We do not digitize the items for you. Um, you will be expected to do that yourself. So, okay. So here is what I'm going to cover um, in this program today. It should take about an hour for me to cover all of this. And then um, we'll have about 30 minutes for questions, depending on, on how many questions you guys have. So in spring of 2020, I did a deep dive program that was four one hour sessions. It was a lot. It was the beginning of COVID and <laughs> we were trying to find things to do. And so um, I did this deep dive. Those sessions, if you should want to watch them, are available on the CALS YouTube channel. Just search for personal archiving. Um, and so you can get even more information. Although I think that this version of the program is actually the most polished and refined. We were trying to figure out some stuff back then and um, we've, we've gotten it better. We've gotten better at it, I guess. Um, there's also a one hour abridged version on YouTube, which was an early version of what you're about to, to hear. So if you want that, this is also today's program is also being live streamed to um, YouTube. So just go to YouTube and type in Central Arkansas Library System. If you type in CALS, you'll get a bunch of stuff in California. But if you type in Central Arkansas Library System, you'll find this information. Um, and I also like to tell people that although I am a public historian and I have some training in archival processes, um, these are not necessarily best practice practices. Um, we like to think of them as goodish practices that are getting the job done, getting what you need to do to get your personal photographs and papers in order and um, saved for future generations. So why is personal archiving important? Who will want all this old stuff? That is a direct quote from my paternal grandmother. Who wants all this junk is what she would say. For historians, the personal papers of everyday people are the great discoveries of the work they do. I would, or the work we do, I would argue that the personal archives, so the private papers, the personal papers of everyday people are more important and more significant to the study of human history than the papers of the great, the famous, or the infamous. Plus, there's more of us, um, everyday people, than there are of them. And so the details of our lives are going to tell a more accurate story of how we lived. Um, the papers, photographs, and letters you've got stored in your basements, attics, and closets can show us how things used to be done and how things in our world have changed. So take this picture of a phone booth in Ravendell, California. I use this as an example to show you how things have changed in your lifetime. Did you ever think that you would not regularly use or see a phone booth or a pay phone? Um, they have become obsolete, and I sure didn't think that this would be um, something of a bygone error. And several years ago, my son and I, we were watching Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner. And in the movie, he is going across the country and, you know, collecting all of these old baseball players, and he has to stop and use a payphone to call his wife to tell his wife about, you know, what's going on, to give her the update. He couldn't text her. He couldn't call while he was driving in his car. Um, he had to stop at a payphone. And my son said, looked at me and said, what is he doing? Why is he having to do that? And it wasn't until that moment that I realized that my child had never used a payphone, never seen a payphone, um, did not need to have a 
dime or later a quarter in his pocket um, to make sure to be able to call home. So that was kind of a big eye-opening thing um, for us. And so, so that's why I use this payphone as an example. So here are some examples of what my boxes looked like at the beginning of this process. Um, like I said, we got the grant in late 2019. We went to this boot camp training in DC um, in January, the, like the last week of January 2020. And then, you know, six, eight weeks later, the world shut down. And so um, as part of that world shutting down process and working from home, I kind of started pulling all of my stuff out, figuring out how to help others you know, get their stuff organized. Um, and I do better by doing that process myself. And so that's how I started. Um, and so what's that old saying about a cobbler's kids have no shoes? Well, the public historian's personal papers were a mess. Um, so as you can see, I've got photographs mixed in with papers and there's a woman's lace clutch in one box. Um, it really, they, they were all over the place. They were in closets, they were under beds. There were some things that were still at my parents' house. So it was just kind of all over the place. <clears throat> so before we get started with the real nuts and bolts of this, um, we're gonna talk about, you know, eventually you're gonna, we're, I'm gonna explain how to go through things and clump stuff, but you kind of need to know where you're going to end up, what you're going to use to store all of this stuff when you're done. Um, the whole purpose of personal archiving is to get everything organized, get it all digitized, and then get the originals stored so you really don't have to touch them unless you absolutely need to. They're going to go away uh, probably up in the top of a closet and just live there forever, maybe until you move house, um, and you're gonna deal with the digitized versions that you have. This is the best way to protect that stuff. So what type of containers are you gonna need? Um, and don't think that you have to go out and buy everything all at once. This is gonna be a long process. Um, I like to tell people this is a marathon, not a sprint. It probably took me um, about eight months working at least one good day a weekend to get all of my stuff organized. Um, and I didn't feel like I had a whole, whole lot compared to what some other people have. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of how much time it's going to take you. Um, and like I said, the whole idea of personal archiving is to digitize everything and then store the original so you do not have to handle it. Okay, so the gold standard of archival storage is going to be this Hollinger box and that's exactly what you see there it's got the the metal rims it is a clamshell so it opens it kind of hinged open um i tell everybody to get the legal size of this don't mess with the letter you may have 99 percent of your stuff maybe in a letter size size format um, but 1% is going to be legal and it's better just to go ahead and get the legal. Um, it gives you a little bit more room and, and you want to try to get, you want all your boxes to either be legal or letter size. That's ideal in a perfect world. You're going to want some legal size acid-free folders. Um, and then you're also going to want some pieces of blue board, which is, you see that picture with my hand. It's the, the blue board is kind of a spacer that you're going to use <clears throat> if you can't fill the box all the way up. You don't want the, you don't want the folders to sag. So Hollinger is a brand name, but it's become a generic, but you can find, you can order these on Amazon. You can order them from companies. There's a company called Gaylord that specializes in archival supplies. Um, there's a place called University Products. But I honestly ordered mine from Amazon um, with my regular Amazon order, um, as well as the as well as the folders. So I got it all, and it came to my door in the middle of COVID. Um, so 
I want to make a disclaimer. So kind of put asterisks or bold or italicize it however you want. Um, acid free is not acid free forever. Um, but for the most part, this stuff should remain acid free in our lifetime. So the box is acid free, the folders are acid free, the blue board is acid free. If you need to purchase paper for any reason to interlace in between things, you're going to want to find acid free paper or acid free tissue. So acid free um, is very, very important. At some point, I will break every scrapbooker's heart and tell them that most of the time the stuff that's used for scrapbooking that says acid free is really not acid free in the way that an archivist thinks of it as acid free. Um, so I'm sorry for if I've made anybody cry right there. There's more to come. Um, so if you have documents like legal documents such as um, deeds or mortgage papers or some old land papers or things that you need to access on a regular basis and you, you can't store it in a Hollinger box and keep it safe away and not ever touch it. Um, you might want to invest in a fire safe file box or fire safe file cabinet. These can get expensive um, pretty quickly. I think the file cabinets run like to the five to eight thousand dollar range. Um, the boxes are less expensive. They're incredibly heavy. But if you have a fire, everything in this box is going to survive. Um, and so if you are worried, this is a great investment. Um, and you want to, you can get acid-free hanging folders, archival quality hanging folders and, um, for file cabinets and file boxes. So you'll want to invest in that instead of a Hollinger box. So um, I am actually a big fan of these big plastic clamshell boxes that you can buy at the big box craft stores. Um, they probably do some off gassing, but it's not terrible. And I use them mainly um, when I was sorting and organizing. You'll see in a minute that I had a constant helper with me. And so I had to, um, anytime I wasn't in the dining room working, I had to get everything put together and put away and, um, because he was not helpful in that regard. So, so I do like these. And there are some that you can get that have um, like a foam or spongy stuff around the inside. So when it closes, it truly is watertight. And these are nice for, you know, personal homes, residential areas sometimes can have um, some water issues. So I do recommend those. For photographs, you might want to invest in some Mylar photo sleeves. And again, you're going to buy those um, from someplace like Gaylord. You can order them on Amazon. Um, they are, it's like a thin plastic um, and they often open on either, they're either closed and open on two sides and two sides or um, they're closed on three sides and it's like a little, a little envelope. Um, those are great, especially if you have some photographs that might have some debris on it and you don't want it touching other photographs. Um, also, these archival or acid-free paper envelopes that open on one end. This is what I ended up using almost exclusively for my personal archiving um, storage, and I really, I really fell in love with them. So the idea is to get multiple barriers between the archival item and the outside environment. So if you've got your photograph here, and then you've got kind of um, mylar, and then an envelope, and then your file folder, and then your box, and then the house and the outside world, you've got a lot of barriers between your thing you're trying to save and the outside environment. So that's the idea, as many layers as possible between item and world. Um, so so that's, that's the goal here that we're getting. Um, again, a lot of these scrapbooking supplies that we see, I was actually at one of those places last night buying something else and I started looking around um, at the products and, um, you know, Colored paper is most likely not going to be acid free. It's going to have some leaching effects. It's just scrapbooking is not as um, long term as I think it's often sold as. Um, so just be aware of that. 
In addition to buying stuff from Amazon, you can also, if you live um, here in Little Rock, we have a container store. They do sell Hollinger boxes. Um, a lot of times you can only get the letter size in store and you have to order the legal size, but they do sell some archival products. They also sell boxes um, to store your wedding dress in, um, which is good, which is nice to have. So some other supplies you might need, acid-free tissue paper is really good. Um, again, you can buy it from Gaylord University Products, um, order it on Amazon, but you want archival quality acid-free tissue paper. Um, same goes with archival quality acid-free paper. Um, regular good old pencils, this you don't have to buy anything special. Um, these Micron pens, you can purchase those at the big box craft stores, usually in the art or drawing, the painting or drawing section. Um, they're Pigma pens and they are, um, they can be reversible. So we're big fans of those. And then I always like to have some of these plastic paper clips, the colored ones, um, kind of around. They're better than the metal ones. They're still not a long term. Um, collection device. I just totally lost the word to keep things together. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. They're not, they're not for long term, but they're, they're there for a short amount of time to keep something together so that there is not, um, they don't get separated. And I see a question. There is not a handout. Um, there is material on, well, I guess technically, yes, there is a handout. If you go to the website, um, let me put it back in the chat in case people came in late. Whoops. Come on, computer. There we go. So if you go to robertslibrary.org slash memory lab slash, um, then it will, there'll be a handout. Might be on the personal archiving page. Let me look at the end of this. There is something um, that you, at least a supply list. Okay. So where to store it once it is digitized or rehoused? Um, you don't want to store your personal archive in the basement. Even a finished basement can be tricky because of moisture issues. Um, even though you may not see or smell moisture, it's there. Um, garages are a no-go. Attics, man the heat, especially this week. Um, and a barn, if you took it out of the barn, do not put it back in the barn. And yes, we have gotten collections that came out of barns. Um, Climate controlled off-site off -site storage might be good um, if you don't have the space in the main part of your house or apartment to accommodate items. Um, but you just, you know, be aware that you're putting it into somebody else's hands and somebody else's insurance. And um, so for me, um, our stuff lives in the center part of our house in a hall closet up in the top. Um, it's actually really hard to get to, and I did that intentionally so I wouldn't be tempted once I got everything digitized to pull stuff out. Um, so it's kind of tucked back in the corner, and um, I did struggle a little bit to get the, the legal size Hollinger boxes kind of turned the right way to get in there. It's like a little puzzle, but, um, but that's where they live in our house. Okay, so now we're going to start the process of really what um, what is this? What, it, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? And it's called clumping. This is an official term from the Library of Congress. I'm not joking. Um, but clumping is simply organizing like things together. Um, before you start clumping, here's a couple of important tips. If you're dealing with papers from different sides of the family um, and they're already separated by family or individual, I would keep them that way. Um, work with one family group or individual at a time, future generations will thank you that you kept like things together in that way. Um, if it's already a mess like mine was, then you're going to make your own order. Um, no big deal. A lot of times we, we get asked a whole lot in my business um, about the white gloves. You see them on TV, you see them on um, Henry Louis Gates show, um, Finding your roots, I think is what it's called. Um, white gloves are not necessary for this process. White gloves are really more intended for objects, um, three-dimensional objects, metal, guns, things like that. 
Um, we don't usually wear white gloves in archival because it can actually, they can grip a hold of the papers and you can rip them. Um, they're sometimes good for photographs, but clean, dry hands are really the best, your best tools um, for this. If you do encounter things like mold, mildew, or other unmentionables, I mean bugs, um, you might want to have some gallon sized Ziploc bags handy. You'll quarantine those items um, and deal with them at a later date. Figure out how you want to deal with them, you know, if you need to get a conservator involved. Before you start clumping, you're going to want to survey your whole collection. You're going to want to get it out of all of its various hiding places and find a temporary storage place in the main part of your house away from pets and kids. Um, assess what different types of things you have in your collection. And here you're thinking about big categories. So you're thinking about letters, documents, photographs, um, and then kind of, I called them random things, um, a purse that was in one box, um, letterman's letters that had been cut off the jacket. So that's, those are kind of random things. And again, if you're dealing with more than one family group, I recommend that you work with one group at the time at a time and better yet one container from one group at a time. So where to work. You want a clean, clutter-free area to work. You want a flat surface for most of the, for most of us, that's going to be a kitchen or dining room table um, that's going to work best. I've even seen someone use a ping pong table and I really wish I had had a ping pong table with a closed door because I had this coworker um, who was really kind of a pain. He wouldn't leave me alone. Um, so you're gonna wanna wipe or dust the surface before starting, but you're not gonna, you don't wanna use pledge or furniture polish ahead of time. Um, if you do use a damp cloth, just make sure your surface is really, is really dry. I honestly, you a lot of times would lay a really old bath towel down, like the kind that you have used it to, it's almost like a slick surface. I would lay it down, um, mainly so that stuff wouldn't slide around um, when, when I was working. And if you do have a coworker like a cat, you might want to segregate them to another part of the house because they are not helpful. Um, a guest bedroom is always nice if you have a big bed that you can lay everything out on and then you can close the door and the pet or the kids um, aren't going to bother it. So at this point, you are just clumping like things together. You're going to keep envelopes with their letters. If you're, if things are stapled, leave them, but don't staple things together. Um, you might want to use plastic paper clips if you're really worried something might get separated. But but at this point, you're just looking at what you have. So. You'll group all the photographs from one box together. If they have stickers or writing on them, don't try to remove the stickers or try to get rid of the writing, but also don't add stickers or add writing to them. Um, if they're in paper frames, like this picture on, I think it's on the right for you guys. Um, if, if they're in these paper frames, leave them together for the time being. Um, if it just happens to tumble out and there's no, the picture tumbles out of the frame and there's no writing on the frame, it's just simply a paper frame, toss that paper frame, it's highly acidic, you don't want it, um, keep the photograph. If you have tin types or daguerreotypes in your collection, do not remove them from their casings, it will, it will ruin them. Um, you're going to want a conservator to take a look at them and figure out how to house them correctly. <clears throat> So get letters, newspaper clippings, papers, and other documents into light groups. I'm fortunate to have a lot of real estate, mortgage, and abstract papers in my collection. My maternal grandfather loved to buy and sell land. Um, it was his hobby. And so I kind of kept all those together. Newspaper clippings, you're going to want to keep all together. So just kind of you're grouping, again, you're grouping light things together. If items are in separate pieces, keep them together either with a plastic paper clip or stick them in an acid-free envelope because um, you don't want the two halves of this to get separated. 
If you have any books that have flowers pressed in them or where the pages are interlaced with newspaper clippings, I would set that whole thing aside um, and deal with it at the end of the box. They are special and they need to be handled differently. The same goes for old family Bibles. You can see in this um, picture, the, the flower, the foliage is actually like attached. It's like, I guess that's a paper staple to the page. And so there it's, there's no getting it out. Um, what you're gonna end up doing is probably taking reference photographs of where, what pages the things were in, removing the extra items out of the book and put them aside and deal with them separately. Um, and we'll talk about family Bibles in a minute because they're a whole nother thing. So here's what the same box looked after clumping. Um, you can see I've got my like groups together for the most part. Now you'll do a further organization after this, as you're digitizing or right before you digitize. So don't be as concerned. I mean, you're just really, you're just sorting at this point. Okay, so the evils of tape and other randomness. Um, as you're clumping and organizing your collection, you're gonna come across some things like tape, ink pen and other stuff. Um, and here is what you might find and how you might deal with some of it. So um, tape is really bad, y'all. It's evil. Um, it's, there's just no way to, to say it. It's an adhesive and it alters the um, makeup of the item it is adhered to. Um, so it can really do a number on paper. You can see here in this example from the Indiana Historical Society that they, you know, this is a letter that probably was folded four ways and they opened it up and it split. And so they've taped it back to, somebody has taped it back together. So not only has the tape colored, but the tape has changed the color of the ink. Um, there is some writing that is missing completely, um, probably because of the tape, maybe because of the, the ripping of the paper, but probably because of the, um, of the tape, we'll, we'll blame the tape. Um, and so you can lose some pretty important information from the past. So I'm gonna get on my soapbox for just a second um, and I can answer more questions about this later, but there is no such thing as archival tape or adhesive. Um, I have seen scrapbooking supplies and rubber stamp supplies listed as archival adhesive. That is not, that is the, that is not a thing. Um, so all tape is bad, please don't use it. Um, and if you've got, like I said earlier, if you've got tape on stuff, I mean, you're gonna have to make some decisions, but, um, but for right now, just kind of leave it be, don't try to remove it. It really takes a professional to remove it. Okay, so if you can't use tape and then you, and you can't use staples either, then how are you gonna keep things together, right? Um, so you're gonna use those mylar sleeves to keep things together for the most part. Um, but if you have our, you know, if you have items that already have tape on them, don't try to remove it. You will digitize it and let the tape finish its destruction. Um, and you can choose, I mean, you can choose to keep it um, or if it's taped, and you don't want to even mess with it, then you can you can truly you can throw it away. It is possible, um, but you want to keep it separate from other non-taped items. So mylar again is going to come into play where you're going to segregate that out from um, the other items. And if it's something that's super important to you, then you're going to need to hire a paper conservator to have it properly cared for and housed. So you'll probably have some film negatives. This is one of those other randomness things. You're probably gonna have some film, film negatives. Um, and so they are so important. They are the original of the thing. Um, you know, a photograph is just a copy of a negative. So you wanna handle these with care. You wanna use clean, dry hands and handle on the edges. Um, you can get these little fine brushes if you have some dirt or dust especially with mounted slides, they tend to get dust on the inside. You just wanna take a real, this real fine brush. Again, if I did a Gaylord, they, ought to, they really ought to like give me a kickback for this, I'm joking. But um, you'll just kind of dust the dust off um, before you scan them. 
So, um, and you don't want to dust onto your other stuff. You want to dust in a separate area. Um, so you can also get negative sleeves like you see there in the binder to house them in. Um, and then I also purchased this archival friendly binder. Um, my husband loves to take, still loves to take film um, photographs. And so we have lots of negatives. If you are fortunate enough to have glass plate negatives, please be careful with them. Um, they need to be carefully conserved and housed by a professional. Okay, so some of the things that you, you may see on the backs of your photographs or maybe even the fronts of your photographs. Um, man, didn't we love to write on the backs of photographs? Um, you don't want to try to erase or remove or white out this stuff. Just let it, just let it be there. Uh, it's probably been, been there for 50 years already. Just let it hang out. Um, but you don't want to add new stuff. So you can see here in my collection, I've got ink pen, I've got pencil, um, I've got printer stamps, just a little bit of everything um, on the backs of my photographs. Now, I'm, you know, writing on the backs of photographs is bad, but it can be helpful at the same time. So it, it's kind of, as archivists, we get a little torn um, about, about this, but you can, I mean, it can help identify people. Just don't continue the tradition, figure out another way um, to, to mark them separately. So here's a good example of the information on a photograph helping you at least know something about the photograph. So I had no idea until a couple of weeks ago, the last month's class, who these people were in this photograph. But thanks to the back of the photograph, somebody had written New Year's Eve, 1968, 1969. And actually during last month's personal archiving class, I'm looking at this photograph and I'm staring at it. And I'm thinking in my head as I'm talking, man, that sure does look like my aunt and my uncle. And sure enough, it is. This is my aunt and my uncle on New Year's Eve, 1968, 1969. Neither of them can remember where they were, but, um, but now we know that it's that it's them um, and they don't seem to know who the woman is that they're talking to either. Um, but yeah, that's kind of cool. And so see, as many times as I've looked at this photograph, I did not know who they were. And then just boom, one day. Um, so the same thing goes with this. Here's a here's a photograph that is stapled into a souvenir frame from um, this was a trip to Mexico that my um, paternal great aunt and uncle took in the, let's see, 1963. Um, and so I knew before even looking at the information on the frame that the woman kind of in the main focus of the picture was my great aunt and her husband um, is to her left, sorry, to her right. And then um, these were their two friends, but she did, actually he wrote down all of the information, where they were. And then the front of the souvenir program tells me even more information, not just that they're in Mexico, but exactly where they're in in Mexico. So this information can be very helpful. So you want to save it and scan it in some way as well. But don't always just assume or glance at something on the back of a photograph and be like, oh yeah, that's such and such. Look at it carefully. Take a little time to do some not even investigation. So we like to talk about listening to your photos. Let them tell the story for you. So here's the front of the photo, two girls, two teenagers. Um, and then I look at the back of the photo and it says 1978 maybe. And so I took a picture and I zoomed in because 1978 was not meshing with what was on the front of the photograph. Front of the photograph, two teenagers. I know one of the teenagers was an adult in her 30s in 1978. So this is not meshing. So when I took a photograph and I zoomed in really closely, it's 197B. This is simply a printer stamp. It has nothing to do with the front of the photograph. So lesson learned. And despite your best efforts, um, things aren't always going to go well. Um, I 
there's got to be a story behind why this woman's photograph and I mean, why this woman's face is about the only thing messed up on the photograph. Um, And there is another photograph of her that has similar markings. So um, I really wish I knew that story. I wish they had written this story on the back of the photograph, but they did not. So my maternal, some other kind of random things that I had in my collection, my maternal great aunt had this postcard album And it was full of these pictures, but she hadn't taped them or glued them in, thank goodness. Um, So I took reference photos of how the photos were arranged on the pages. And then I removed them, took them them out, um, scanned them individually. And I actually threw this postcard album away because that, that dark paper, that black paper is highly acidic. So one of the things that I did a lot was take reference photos because I was working, um, I was kind of stop, stop, start, stop, start. Um, And I had this cat that was trying to help me and he wasn't being very helpful. And so I took lots of reference photographs. And sometimes I did not do very successful with my reference photos. You can see, I mean, I was using my iPhone. And so, you know, you take the picture and sometimes if you move too quickly, it blurs. So I ended up setting up this tripod um, at the end of my dining room table so I could put the photograph, hit the button, and then it would, it would actually capture the image um, or the page rather than, um, rather than making a blurred photo. Um, so what if there's already damage? In this situation, there's not much you can do for this item. I mean, even a paper conservator really can't do a whole lot. Um, This was a yearbook from, um, I think, Mulberry High School, um, where my, one of my, well, my grandmother went, my maternal grandmother went. And um, so what I did was I took the pages, the pages that I could get apart, I took them apart and I took photographs of them. And then I threw the whole thing away because there wasn't anything um, really left. And hopefully somebody else saved it without water damage and it's in an archive somewhere. Newspapers are the most acidic paper out there. I'm pretty sure. I say that every time and then I always think, is that too much of a statement? But it's pretty acidic. So here's what it can do. Um, I'm sure y'all, some people have these where you have a scrapbook and you rubber cemented articles, newspaper articles that, you know, clippings out of the paper and, and it's been closed for years and years and then it has leached onto the other side of the paper. And more newspaper clippings glued into scrapbook pages. Um, I photographed these or scanned them, whichever was best. Um, and then the threw, then threw the pages away because there's information on here that I didn't know and that I wouldn't be able to find very easily in um, newspapers, even in indexed newspapers. Magnetic photo albums from the late 20th century. Man, there's got to be a whole like section on that. So we all have these. <clears throat> At least people my generation all have them. Um, Some of them really held on to their photos really well. Some of them did not. If the photos are loose on the pages, take a reference photograph and then remove the photos and then scan them individually. Sometimes there's writing on the back of them. If they're stuck on the page, just leave them stuck, scan them or photograph them stuck to the page, eventually they should pull off or come off. But if you try to pull them off, they will literally curl um, and you'll really ruin the photograph. And sometimes they take the backing and the photograph with them. So it's just, just take reference photographs, scan them. You'll get the information. Baby books, um, again, scan. Don't try to remove the information. Um, Scan the photos you can scan a whole page and then scan individual photos. Um, our scanner really does a great thing. Three-dimensional objects inside of scrapbooks are, are um, usually taped or stapled into um, scrapbooks or baby books. Um, if they aren't loose, just leave them. Family Bibles. Um, so Bibles on a whole are printed on 
because they're, they're mass printed. They're printed on pretty inexpensive quality paper. The covers are, are not um, a good quality. And so they tend to deteriorate um, very quickly. And so, but we also love to put things in Bibles. We love to leave things in Bibles. So this is where you're gonna take a photograph of the item in its, you know, in its area, where is it? Because maybe they meant for it to be in Deuteronomy. Maybe it has, maybe it has nothing to do with that. They just stuck it in there, but sometimes it means something. And so you want to, you, that may, that connection may come later. So you want to kind of know, um, scan those front pages or the middle pages. Some Bibles have the front pages with birth, marriage, death. Some have a middle well, um, scan them, take photographs of them. And then you're going to want to store it in an acid-free box if you, if you really want to keep it, if you really need to keep the actual Bible um, in some kind of safe space, then you're going to want to get an acid-free um, box. They make them, you want it just a little bit bigger than your Bible and you'll take acid-free tissue paper and you'll crump it, crumple it and kind of move it loosely around so it's not it can't, like if you pick up, up the box, you can't move the Bible around a whole lot. Um, there are wooden Bible boxes for sale on Etsy right now. I do not recommend those. Somebody asked me um, a couple months ago about those because the paper and the board that is used as the cover of the Bible are made out of wood. And the box that you're putting it in is made out of wood. And that's just a bunch of wood <clears throat> and it loves to kind of eat on itself and deteriorate over time. Um, so it would just kind of be a little feast for, um, it would just, yeah, I can only imagine what it would do. So I would not recommend those. So going digital, now that you've gone through everything and clumped everything together, um, you're going to take a couple of steps to further organize everything um, in, in your clumped groups. And then you're going to start digitizing items one by one. Now, you're going to create an organization and digitization system that works for you. I'm going to tell you how I did it, um, but it may not work for you, and you may need to tweak some of the things that I did to make it work for you. If you make it too complicated, which I did at first, um, you will most likely not stick with it, which I did not stick with it. So, um, the point of all of this, again, is to digitize all your items so you do not have to handle them again. You will store your originals and share the digitized copy with friends and family, etc. So now I'm going to talk about file storage, digitization process, and naming your files. So what options do you have for storage? What format should you be saving your photographs in and how to name your files? Um, I'm talking specifically about photos and documents that are scanned from their paper originals, not born digital, digital items. So stuff on Facebook, your digital camera, your smartphone. This is, that's a different class which we haven't created yet. We are going to, but we haven't gotten there yet. So you want to make your system your digitization process as simple as possible or you'll end up with a face like this baby. That's my father. Um, okay, so storage. We're gonna start with storage. Storage is so important um, because you want to be able, your digital, your digital storage is so important because you want to find, you wanna be able to find your stuff and you wanna be able to, um, use it when you, when you need to, you know, you, you don't want to be like searching for it forever. Um, that doesn't, that's no fun. So ideally you want to store your digital files in at least two geographically different locations to safeguard against a massive data loss. We recommend three different storage solutions for personal archives. Um, the cloud, so that's iCloud, Google Drive, Dropbox, um, Amazon storage solutions. There's a lot of them out there. An external hard drive storage, which is a little thing, a little bit bigger than a deck of cards that you plug in USB to your computer and you're storing directly onto that. And then a personal server. 
personal server is going to be out of most people's reach. Um, they can be expensive. There's lots of maintenance you have to do on them. So, but we always like to just tell people that that's, that's out there if you need it. So once you've picked your storage solution, you want to check on your files. Once you check, once you've picked it and you've, you digitized everything, you want to check on your files at least once a year to make sure that the device is working properly and that the files are accessible. Um, we recommend that you put an automatic repeatable reminder on your calendar to do it once a year. So storage, cloud, external hard, external hard drive, personal server. Okay, there we go. So technology is always changing. Um, you know, think about the different kinds of technology that you've experienced in your life. LPs, 8-track, maybe reel-to-reel, -reel, um, audio cassettes, I <laughs> forgot the word there for a minute, audio cassettes, and then CDs and DVDs. I think I was actually thinking about what I'm about to tell you about CDs and DVDs. It's just going to break people's hearts. Um, so, but before I say that, um, cloud storage sites such as Google Drive, Dropbox, and iCloud are convenient. Um, but any photos you store on cloud storage device are managed by somebody else. An external hard drive can store a large amount of data in a centralized place, and a personal, a personal server is the most expensive of the options and needs to be maintained with backup and other maintenance that you're going to have to do personally. So if you put stuff in the cloud, somebody else is maintaining it, but they probably know what they're doing. External hard drive is pretty no nonsense. Personal server, a little bit more um, involved. So personally, I use to I use the cloud storage that I can access and I can share it with friends. I can share those folders with friends and family. Um, they can only read the files. They cannot edit or change them. I set it up that way. And then I also have everything backed up to an external hard drive. Also know, somebody asked this um, one time that I gave this program, also know that your external hard drive is going to be the platform that you, of the computer that you use. So if you are a PC user, your external hard drive is a PC external hard drive. If you are a Mac user, your external hard drive is a Mac external hard drive. There is a way to partition it where you can have an external hard drive with a PC side and a Mac side, but that is far more complicated. I don't even know how to do that. I mean, I know in theory how to do it, but it's complicated. So just know that. Because if you're a cross-platform family, that can be challenging. Um, okay, so now for the other crying moment of this program. CD-ROMs, DVDs, and flash or jump drives are not, I repeat, are not long-term storage solutions. And I even put the floppy disk on there because it was just kind of funny. Um, really, who has a floppy disk anymore? I know somebody out there is going, I do. Um, and we will have a way for you to get those files off um, of the floppy, of the small floppy, not the big floppy. It's not the five inch, but the three and a half. Um, so, so yeah, if you've got a bunch of stuff stored on CDs, um, photos maybe that you took and you had them digitized by somebody and you had them, you have them stored on CDs, you're going to want to get those off of those CDs onto the cloud or onto an external hard drive. Same for jump or flash drives and DVDs. They are just not stable. Um, a lot of times people bring a flash drive and they use the flash drive to get their um, digitized photographs from the memory lab to their home computer. And that's fine. That is definitely short term, but this is, these are not storage solutions long term. Okay. Now everybody put their tissues away and we're going to talk about digitizing. Um, so you've clumped, you've, you've got your storage, you've got your physical storage solutions and you've got your digital storage solutions. You've got it all sorted out. And now really comes the fun part. Um, you're going to start scanning. And I, um, I took each box that had been clumped and I further organized it. And you can see that here where I've got, I further clumped almost by person. 
um, here. I, I grouped them together so that I kind of knew who I was scanning at the same, you know, all at once. Also, it helped me with naming um, because I didn't have to retype over and over again. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, this is my next level clumping. So I've taken one box that was clumped and sorted it further. So this box has a lot of different types of materials in it. Um, I usually started with the photographs because I had the most of those and I think they are the most fun. Um, when you have a lot of photographs and you don't know who those people are and you don't, nobody labeled the backs of them for you. So you're gonna, you know, you're like, who is this? You're gonna look at, for, for naming, you're gonna look at clothing and other clues to keep the grouped photos together. Um, Cause it is easier to scan a bunch of like things together. So if you have a set of photos that maybe is labeled Christmas 1954, um, you might consider using the file name Christmas 1954 with a one after it. When you're scanning, um, how the scanner, how most scan, scanning programs work is it has kind of a generic name that you are able to assign. So Christmas 1954, and then it'll scan all of the photographs and it'll start with one, two, three and count its way up as it's scanning. And until you change that start name, that beginning name, Christmas 1954, it'll keep scanning and counting up. Um, because for a lot of people, you're kind of scanning on the fly, you're trying to get everything scanned and then you're gonna go back and name it. Um, so that's what I did. So yeah, Christmas 1954, that was actually a group of my photographs. Um, and then I could do more research on who they were or, um, you know, more information. So, also, and I did not take a picture of this and I really regret it, I wish I had. Um, I used a whole lot of those um, Ziploc sandwich bags, the fold over kind to keep my groups of photos together because again, I was having to pick all of this up every night, put it back in its box and I wanted to keep my organization as much as possible. And so I would do that little Ziploc bag and then I would put, um, a post-it note on the bag with the name of whoever I thought the person was um, to keep them to keep them together. So you're scanning, you're going to lay um, multiple photographs with about a quarter of an inch in between the photos out on the glass. Um, this is my scanner at home. It does a little bigger than eight and a half by 11 um, scanning surface. And the one here does, I think 11 by 14, it might go up to 11 by 17, but I think it's 11 by 14. Um, and so you can, for, you know, like four by six or even, you know, three by five photos, you can get quite a few on the glass at once. Um, and so the flatbed scanner is the best way to go. You are not sending photos through the auto feed. Please don't do that. Um, new, new scanners, you can put all of them, like I said, all of them on the glass, and then you, you kind of do one pass and it will identify each photo individually. My home scanner did not do a very good job on that. I'll show you in just a second. The one out here does a fabulous job finding the photo, like identifying each photograph. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna have kind of like a little sidebar. The there are tons of apps out there. I mean, you all know that there's, there's an app for everything. There are scanning apps that you can use on your phone um, to do this kind of scanning. And I have not used any of them, but I hear great things. Um, there's Google Photo Scan for Android users. There's something called Cam Scanner for scanning documents. So um, it's up to you, but Flatbed is gonna get you the best result um, for scanning. Okay, so, so here's kind of the basics. You're scanning on a flatbed. Again, do not use the auto feed. I know it's fun, but please don't. You're gonna scan your photos as color, as color scans, even if they're black and white, because you're gonna want some of that sepia tone. You wanna really see what it is um, because black and white will take all of that out. 
you're going to scan them as JPEGs with at least at least 300 DPI. Most people here are scanning at 600 DPI. That was taking a lot of time at my house. <laughs> so I went with 300 for the most part. Um, so the bigger, the, the higher the number DPI, the larger the file you're creating. So you also have to think about that storage wise. So the scanner settings can be changed for each set of scans. Um, so if you have a smaller photograph that you want a higher resolution, you can always go in and change it. Um, if you change the settings for each, each overview pass. So this is what it looks like when my scanner at home, not the one here, does it. And you can see, so this is when it's on the auto selection feature. <laughs> it didn't really hit the photo very well. Um, and so I was still having to draw like a go in with my cursor and pull that box and make it fit the thing. So it wasn't doing very well. So what I ended up doing was not using the auto selection, would do an uh, on my scanner, it's called overview pass. Out here, it's called preview overview pass and then going in and drawing lines because if I was gonna have to do that anyway, I might as well do it um, on my own. The one out here has a thumbnail setting that, I mean, it knows it all, it's awesome. So, um, okay, what was that? Oh, so, so yeah, so that's what it looks like. So here's my scanning process. You open the scanner app or driver on your computer with your photos laid out on the glass, you're gonna click overview or preview. Um, and it's gonna take a, a one pass at the scan and then you'll be able to manipulate it um, and, and make sure it's getting the right sections. Um, you create the selection box around each image, and then you're gonna select your scan mode, your kind of scan, your resolution, where you want it to scan to. So your scan mode is gonna be flatbed. Your kind is color. Your resolution is three to 600, maybe 1200 if it's really small. Um, where you're scanning it to, <clears throat> where on the computer, whether it's an external hard drive or it's the actual hard drive, the location that the file is going to end up, and then the format of the file. So you're also able to create a name for a group of scans. So I could have said that this was Joe Register. These are all my father. I could have said Joe Register and then gone back in. It would have said Joe Register one, Joe Register two, three, four, five, and then gone in and made some very unique file names for them. But what I ended up doing most of the time was just calling it scan and I would work in small groups. And so I would scan a group and it would do scan, scan one, scan two, scan three. And then I would go back in and change the file name, name later. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I work on a Mac, but all of this applies to a PC in some form or fashion. So when I was scanning, I scanned to that folder that's called unprocessed scans. And that's where things would sit until I had time to rename them and then move them into these two folder, folders, one called Clarendon, one called Ozark. Those represent the two sides of my family. And so I was making sure that things went in to those right areas. If it was something like a document with pieces and parts, I would make an additional photo that would then go into those bigger folders. <clears throat> so um, I would scan, I would direct the scanner to scan to unprocessed scans. And then I would go into that folder and I would start renaming and you can see I would look at the thumbnail or I would create it as a preview and I would get somewhat detailed with my names, but not terribly. Like if I knew the person's name, if it had some information on it, um, in a Mac, you're able to use punctuation in your file names, which is great. So I would put in parentheses what was physically written on the on the photo. Um, that kind of helped me delineate between the two. And then um, I would try to give as much information as possible about the photo. Now, what if I didn't know the person? Then honestly, in some ways it was easier. I would just look at the photo, 
and think, what is this photo of, and use that. So this photo is actually named Baby in Blue Vest sitting in lawn chair. I only had one of them, but it's a unique name and you have to have a unique name. I mean, the computer requires it. You don't have to, the computer requires it. So um, you can also use, click on the info in a Mac. It's this, it's called something else in a PC that I can't think off the top of my head, but it's, it's where you can go and see what the file is, you know, what the file size is. Um, I'm looking over here at my other screen because it's bigger. Um, when it was created, I, it was modified. I think it's called properties. Thank you. Properties. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. I, yes. Live so, I live so much in a Mac world that I yeah. <laughs> PC stuff. Yeah. So, so you go over there and you can add tags. Um, so I would tag these as, um, so Clarendon 1.30 is Clarendon box one envelope 30. So that helps me find it a little bit better. Um, and then when it's all said and done, this is how my boxes looked, my photo boxes at least. Um, I used a lot of these envelopes, a lot of these little, um, they're actually five by seven envelopes. Um, and I would put probably 12 photos in one. I wasn't doing individual, you can do individual envelopes. It was, that was more than I wanted to do. Um, and I, you can see in the middle photograph, I started writing like out every name of every photo in the folder and my hand wore out. So I ended up with this number system. Box one, envelope 25, I tagged them in the computer so I can find them. So when you come to use the memory lab, this is what the um, flatbed scanner side looks like. Um, it's a very large Epson scanner that we purchased with the grant money and then a PC computer. Um, it has an extra monitor on it so that you can have one screen open where you um, can name your files as they're as they're transferring over. You can do up to 11 by 14. I even wrote it there so that it is 11 by 14. Um, the amount of items that you can do, we get this asked this question a lot. The amount of items you can do really depends on what you're digitizing, whether it's photos or um, slides, the size of it, and then how big you're scanning them to. We'll tell you how much time, it takes to process. Um, so again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You're not gonna um, get this done in one setting, most likely. The AV station will open August 9th. <clears throat> You'll be able to digitize initially VHS, and then later on we will have beta and mini DV available as well as audio cassette. Um, we do like to warn people that digitizing digital AV media takes the amount of time that is on the tape. So if it is a two hour tape, it will take two hours to digitize it and then about 10 minutes to render that video um, as a digital file. Um, so those appointments will be slightly longer, by the way. So once you've got everything digitized, um, you can share it with your friends and family. And that's really the fun part. And then you can start finding out who some of these people in these photos are. Um, so, okay, now let me take questions. I see there are questions in the chat. Let me. Let me end the show. Oops, let's do that. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> it is so hot outside. I do not have any saliva left. Um, let's see. What was the flat machinery we can use at the main library to digitize our items? So is the flat, the flat scanner, the flatbed scanner um, is here at Roberts. It's across the street from the main library. Um, and you'll make an appointment by going to see, yeah, 
You'll make an appointment by going to robertslibrary.memorylab. I'm sorry, robertslibrary.org slash memorylab in order to um, make an appointment. And the appointments are two hours in length. Next week, actually starting tomorrow, the memory lab will be closed for a week because staff is out on vacation. So um, it is open, and I also need to tell you, it is open Monday through Friday from 1015 to 430. And there's, there's three two-hour blocks in that time frame. Saturday appointments are truly by appointment only. We do not have staff right now to man the memory lab on Saturdays. So you just need to email. Um, actually, you can just email me directly to set up a Saturday appointment. And we do Saturday appointments from 10.15 to 2.30. And I need to get, hang on, let me do the handout question before I forget because I will so forget. Get the right address, make sure I'm sending you to the right place. So this is the personal archiving page on our website. Oh, I see here. Let's let me give you the memory lab with the actual hyperlink because I didn't put the HTTPS and it doesn't want to link it. There we go, that'll make it easier. So the, the personal archiving page has um, information, this information, it has a supply list um, as well as links to these videos, to the long version of the video, to the abridged version of the video, as well as a more recent version. So um, you can go back and double check um, the information there. Okay, now then, let's see. Okay, someone asks, the photograph with the woman's face removed made me wonder about archiving photographs saved from a home that had been burned. Um, I mean, if if they're not if they're not completely destroyed, you do want to try to save as much information as possible. Um, you might want to consult with a paper conservator or a photo conservator um, to find out kind of you know what information can be. They can do they can do a lot. Um, you know, this this process is truly digitizing what is seen, not correcting any errors, not editing. It is just digitizing um, what can be seen. And so, but they can be reconstructed as well. So you might want to check. Um, there is an organization of conservators that we recommend. Well, if I can type. So this organization is the Professional Organization for Conservators and they have a find a conservator link on their page. So you might check there. I don't wanna say it's, you know, it's a lost cause because if there's any kind of information on them, I mean, that's something, you know, when someone's house burns, you, you think about people losing everything. And if there's something to save, I would, I would hope that they could. Um, let's see, someone asks, I started trying to scan photograph pictures and other items. And then I ran into how do I digitize the digital versions naming conventions, file name and folder names seem to work best only when the picture article is about one person or a group of people. Um, so like I said, it, you do have to make it your own. For me, I work best with large containers is what I think of them as. 
big folders with lots of stuff in them. Um, I don't, I do bad. I don't, I don't do bad. I do, I don't do well, I guess, with minutia. Um, so I need a big container. So that's why I would have, I have these two, I have these two folders, one same Clarendon, one same Ozark. And inside those folders are all of the pictures from each side of the family. Um, the only time that I made a subfolder in there was like, I had a driver's license. I had my grandparents' driver's license and union cards and journeyman cards and stuff like that, that had a front and a back. And so if it had a front and a back and I wanted to keep it together, I would make a folder specifically for that. My mom really wanted me to make sure that we remembered all the items that were in my grandfather's wallet when he died. And so all of those items were scanned individually and put into a folder called John Harold's wallet so that she would be able to know what was, what was there. So that's how I organized my, fo my folders, my actual containers. File naming, um, you know, so many things you can search so well now. Um, and so, I mean, you could do like a person. If you knew that all these photographs were one person inside your bigger container, you could have a folder just with them. Um, but I use the names to do that. So I would make sure if I knew the person that I used the name over and over and over again. So when you go to search for not for mod newbie, they're all going to come up and you're going to be able to see it. And also you can look at it. I look at everything in an icon. I rarely look at a list. So I look at the icon so I can kind of see. So that's what was helpful to me. And I hope that that's helpful to you. Um, I will also say oftentimes I will change my path midstream. And I did that, I think twice on this project um, and went back and had to fix things. So um, there's not a, there's not a, um, a foolproof method, I guess. There's not one way to do it. What about backblaze? Any opinions? I honestly don't know what black backblaze is. Oh, it's a storage. Well, I've never heard of it, so I don't have an opinion. Um, and I usually have an opinion for everything. So um, I don't know, but you know what? Um, I can find out, I have, I have a coworker who probably has heard of it. So let me make sure that I make a note to myself to ask Anna. My thought, I mean, kind of just my gut reaction, not knowing anything about it, is that you want, you know, you want to go with a with a cloud storage that is going to stick around for a while, right? I mean, we don't have Netscape anymore. So just think about that. The technology changes so fast. I think that's why we probably usually tell people to, you know, use Google Drive or um, Dropbox or um, iCloud because they seem to have some staying power. But I'll find out. I found out for you, Deborah, and um, I'll, I'll email you back. Um, let's see. Do you do any group, any, do you group any by person? I didn't even, Alan, I don't even get to that level of minutia. I really don't. I, let me show, I, I think I can, let me share my screen and show you what my, deeper what my folder looks like. Okay. So, so here's what everything looks like. I did add a register folder here, um, but say we'll look in Clarendon. 
and here's all my fold my folders and um so yeah i mean it is it's a lot of randomness but i can find stuff in here um now i will say that my grandmother <clears throat> my grandmother saved every you know these little tiny photos these little tiny school photos um she saved every single one of them so i can find stuff for the most part in here but i did try to use people's names um as much as possible but you could um i mean you could definitely you know have different folders for different different family groups within Um, Craig would like to know, are there acid free Ziploc bags? Probably not found at the dollar store. No, they're not acid free Ziploc bags. The Ziploc bags were temporary, um, just for storage, mainly to keep my cat away from them. I mean, truly, that was it. And I will tell you, for all of you environmentalists out there, they got reused. Um, <laughs> they got reused for my kids' lunches last year. So yes, we kept them all. Um, and so, so yeah, it was, but, but it did help. They were a nice little container that I could, that I could easily keep stuff together in and they weren't in there for very long. Um, so yeah. Yes, this will be available for later viewing, Sally. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and then you can also find last month's, which I think may have been a better version um, for that's, that's on that website, personal archiving. Um, what's the name of the professional conservative organization? It is right here. I'll drop it back in the chat. Whoops. Um, its website is called Cultural Heritage, but the actual name is, I think, let's see, what is it? The American Institute for Conservation is what it's actually called. Oh, sorry, Alan. Okay, so yes. So naming naming the picture, I I named I I had run on names. Um, I named lots. I just put as much information in that file name as humanly possible. So yes, I added, if there were more than one person in there, all they all of them got named. Um, at some point, it tells you to stop. Like it says you have too many characters. And so I started abbreviating, you know, William was WM and George was GEO and stuff like that. But yeah, I added everybody's name to the file. Um, because I, the way I look at it is I never know who I'm going to be looking for. So yes, yes, you want to do that for sure. And maybe, I don't know, you could come up with an abbreviation system for different people. That would not, I would not, personally, that would not work for me because I would lose my list of the abbreviations and then I wouldn't be able to remember who, <laughs> who was abbreviated which way. Um, so, so yeah, but uh, yeah, I wrote out, I mean, I wrote out everything. Um, and then, and then you have the other side of that where you don't know the people's names at all. And so you just start, you know, I had so many, you know, little girl with glasses that I had to start like looking at the collar of the shirt to say, or, you know, little boy in cowboy suit. Well, or cowboy hat, we had a lot of those too. So. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Heather, um, I was curious, is there a list of, um, so the, to, in order to buy, buy, say like, you know, if I'm gonna start this process of, mm -hmm. and then, you know, like all that organizing and so on, and then is there, is Gaylord really the only, I mean, to me, when I go to Gaylord's website, it's some of that stuff is really expensive. And are there lower cost options, but still having stuff that good stuff that could be st stored permanently in? Um, you can sometimes find stuff on Amazon, but most of it, 
the the prices in Gaylord are not you're not going to find it a whole lot cheaper. Um, it is honestly because they put the word archival next to it, it becomes more expensive. It it takes so yeah, it is. This is it's not cheap, and that's why I mean, you know, I think people probably have their mouths drop open when I show that I have you know a dozen little photographs in one envelope but those envelopes are expensive and I wasn't going to do an envelope per photo right um, and so yeah so I'm I'm really good at packing it in um right. and and it kind of depends I mean you can get a lot of stuff into a Hollinger box um, a lot more than, than you might imagine. You can get about a dozen folders with about a dozen or more sheets of paper per. Um, it what, depends on how thin, you know, but I mean, so you can get a lot the, of it. I'm sorry, what's the name of that box? Hollinger. Hollinger. Yeah, and that's what they're selling at Gaylord is Hollinger. Um, Hollinger. Yeah, so it's, I'll put it in the chat. Um, okay. It's H O L L I N G E R is the brand name, but it's kind of become a generic um, to to represent. Here, let me hang on. I've got one. Yeah. They come in different colors too. I mean, not like bright colors, <laughs> but they come in yeah. light gray, dark gray, and beige. Um, and so, yeah, so this is what, this is what a legal Hollinger size box looks like. And okay. That's where it is. And I've stored, I've, I use, <laughs> I don't even buy blue board. I store, I use my other folders as the, as the spacer in the back. But yeah, I mean, I've got, let's see, in this box, I've got one, I've got eight folders and some of them have as much as, I bet this folder has 30 pieces of paper in it. In the uh, are the folders acid free as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, you want everything to be acid free. Um, so I did, so I did not order directly from Gaylord. Um, sometimes University Products is a company that you can find archival supplies a little bit less expensive. Um, and Amazon, there's a company, I think it's called Linco that, that has, that Amazon sells. And that's what I bought was Linco, My, mainly because I, I didn't want to pay shipping. So Amazon, and can you spell Linco? Um, let me make sure I spell it right. <laughs> I'm a bad speller, and so it's been a while since I've done this. So yeah, yeah, I think I'm a, I'm the I'm like you. I would want to save money on shipping and and go with a, a, lo a lower expensive. Yeah, if I can get it in two days from Amazon, um, I guess it's Lineco. It's L I N E C O on Amazon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's um. You know, you'll only have to buy it once. You can look at it that way, right? Um, you yeah. can. So if you don't go with archival like this, right? If you don't go with archival like that, then what you can do, you could also go plastic. So you could go to um, a big box craft store and buy, they they sell, you know, these plastic clam shell shelled boxes um, for crafting stuff and they often have them for photos and stuff like that so you can do that container store sells them as well so they're a little bit um, less expensive I don't know professionally if there's a lot of concern about the plastic off gassing onto the item I and mean, that can always be an issue with any kind of plastic product because I'm sure it's not BPA free because um, it's industrial plastic but um but yeah, you might, you could always do that as well. So. But, the, but those would be uh, acid free plastic clamshell boxes, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know that well, they're gonna say acid free, but it should be theoretically. 
plastic clamshell boxes at craft stores. Okay. Just that other ideas or some other options are good than just going to one big company. Yes, yes. Well, Gaylord is who we've been, you know, I've been buying for most of my professional clear, career. So it just kind of flows off the, it just. Yeah, so so for um, professional, for, for organizations, you know, they, but for individuals that are on a, t- a teacher's budget, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. not about to spend $1,000 for material, you know, right. for storage materials boxes and so yeah. on yes so yeah yeah any other Thank questions you. you're welcome yeah well thanks everybody for coming and um make appointments to use the memory lab um it's here for you to use shoot me questions if you have questions or if you have any problems um with registering to use the memory lab It'll send it to memory lab at cows.org, but that comes to me as well. Or you can send me an email directly. I think I put my email um, in the chat a minute ago somewhere. Um, But yeah, that's what we're here for. So thanks everybody and have a great weekend.